Hello, good afternoon, and welcome to the Gavin Davis podcast with my co-host Dave Bruff. Um, we're going to discuss a number of things today. This is uh, season one, episode two. Uh, first of all, I just want to touch on our Instagram page, the Gavin Davis podcast. You can follow us on there and you can see what we're getting up to on a daily, weekly uh, basis. There will be links uh, and short videos put on there, which will link to our YouTube channel, which is also the Gavin Davis podcast. So you can subscribe on there and follow our full podcast, which will be uploaded to the channel. Uh, I just want to give some of our sponsors a quick mention. First of all, I want to uh, mention uh, Matt Bottomley, uh, which is at Matt's Barbershop. Uh, if you want a haircut, a really good haircut at an affordable price, then please pop down to the to the barbers down there in Kevin. You can pick him up on Instagram and Facebook as well. Uh, also, you can follow his brother called Adam Bottomley. And he it's, it's a family-run business, really good business, good lads. So give them a hookup. Also got House of Jiu-Jitsu, which is my good friend Costantinos out in Cyprus. Uh, he's sponsoring the podcast. As everyone knows, I've got really good links with Costantinos and all my Cypriot brothers out there. So if you want to get some good training in while you're in Cyprus on holiday, please pop into his dojo in Limassol and you will um, have a great session with Costantinos. So what I'm going to do, I'm going to hand you over to Dave. Um, and Dave's going to le- Dave's going to lead lead this today. Uh, he's our, he's the co-host. Um, so I'm just going to pass you over, and away you go, Dave. Thanks, Gav. Great to be here uh, as always. Um, I thought with this episode, Gav, we could just explore maybe a little bit about motivations, mindsets for competing, and then some more technical aspects and get your insight into a few things. Um, yeah. So in episode one, you talked about your MMA career, you had four pro fights. I mean, coming from a more traditional martial arts background, what were your motivations for going into MMA? Hmm. Originally, it was watching the Gracies at the original UFCs. I was fascinated by what they were doing. I was fascinated by Ice Gracie. And Elio and the family and everything and what and then obviously with them getting into pride and that and uh, what Henzel was doing, what Hickson was doing. So I was originally fascinated with that. That was a big motivation for me. And then from there, I just got to an age. I just, I just really, I, I really enjoyed staying in shape, keeping fit. And I always believed that. I always believed in the athleticism and the athletes in MMA. MMA got a very bad rep early on. Oh, it's a brutal sport. People are going to get killed. And the original UFCs, yeah, the, the rule set wasn't there and the and the the format wasn't there. But what, what they did later on, by the time like Dana White and that took it over, like I think it was about UFC 28, was they formatted it with a with a proper rule set. They made it a legitimate sport. And look at the athletes it's produced. Like, and I always believed in the athleticism of it. I believe it's the greatest sport in the world mixed with the Brazilian jiu-jitsu, I really do. Um, I don't think that, if you look at some of the athletes in UFC, I don't think there's better athletes on the planet, unless you're going to look at specific gymnasts um, and maybe rugby players, they're up there as well. Um, So I always thought about, I like fighting. I enjoy watching fighting. I love everything about fighting. Love everything about martial arts. And I just always thought to myself that, why don't I do something that's going to keep me fit and keep me healthy and have to look after myself to the best of my ability? Every sportsman or sportswoman will get injured. As you grow older and you sit in your chair as an 80, 90, 100-year-old person, I've never met one that hasn't got an underlying illness or hasn't got aches and pains. So I thought to myself, when I get to that age, if I'm if I've got aches and pains, at least I've done something the eight years before that I've enjoyed. So, yeah, yeah I, I absolutely love it. Absolutely love it. I love, I'm, I'm really looking at the psychology of fighting at the moment. I'm studying that. Um, really interested in that. We okay. can talk about, um, talk about that on another yeah. episode if you want. But Yeah, or, or yeah. we can come back to it. But yeah. Do, going back to where you were in your martial arts journey. Yeah. Going into those MMA fights, what was your outlook in terms of where are you looking to 
beat somebody with strikes or was your game plan to take somebody down or did you did you study your opponents before you go in how did you approach it no in in the early days um i remember doing some competitions through andy walker with the mma league they were amateur based so you just turn up on the day and then you'd you'd match a fight and then you were just fighting whoever um but when i went semi-pro and then yeah by the time i got to pro level i I was more organized i was more switched on to everything really but semi-pro i was just i was clutching at straws in the beginning mate to be honest with you i think my fitness and my athleticism carried me quite a way um when we get Aaron Aby on the podcast, I want to discuss this actually because he had he had a better schooling in MMA than I did. So by the time he had his first semi pro fight, and I had my first semi pro fight, he he had his dad and his his uncle Julian and that coaching him for a number of years. So his his schooling, his foundation with the lads he'd been training with, like Gareth Gareth Roberts, uh, Nick Jones, and all them, he, he was he was developmentally massively ahead of me with game plans what he was good at what you know what I mean I was just getting in there and I was winging it on the first couple of semi pros to be honest with you um I was just there because I just wanted wanted to I just wanted to fight and I wanted to I wouldn't say I wanted to branch out from traditional jiu-jitsu and traditional martial arts but I wanted I always had it in the back of my mind you're only going to be young once and you, I don't want to get old and think oh, I should have done that so I wanted to have a go. And then once I had a go, I realized that oh, I really enjoy it. I really enjoy the fighting aspect of it. I really enjoy the training aspect of it. So, but we'll talk to Aaron about that when we get Aaron on on a later episode. Okay. Um, but yeah, I, w- I would yeah. say the first couple of semi-pros, when I, when I watch the videos back, I haven't watched them for a number of years, to be fair, but um, the lads were in proper MMA gyms with lads who were, we, we, we're training MMA daily, whereas okay. I was crossing from the traditional and I was maybe once a week going wrestling or once a week going okay. a tie and then trying to keep my traditional up. That that so was you... obviously early doors or that. Okay. So at that time in your career, you didn't really have, you weren't going in to take them down and, and sub, submit them. You were just going to go and see with the mix of martial arts you had, what worked out on the day. Yeah. I, I would yeah. say I was stronger on the floor than my stand up my stand up was terrible and it I, it never got to an elite level my stand up i worked hard on my stand up for a good few years and i did improve my stand up but there was lads probably come came a little later than me at my weight who that you know i watched these lads on cage warriors now and their stand ups is it's ridiculous like do you know what i mean my stand up yeah. was never like that so i was yeah. trying to evade make sure i didn't get hit with a big one and if I had to take one, I'd, I'd take that. But, um, yeah, I was always probably trying to engage in the grapple. It wasn't until I came pro that, yeah, I now I want to go. I want to get in. I want to mm. land a combo. I want to clench. And I used to like the leg kicks, mate. I got I got quite good at the leg kicks at one stage. Um, That was working with Russ for, you know, in that Thai gym for a, for a couple of years. Uh, I like the leg kicks. They worked well for me. I was able to land leg kicks from different distances, even even quite close in the clinch. Um, but yeah, I would always say my grappling was my mm-hmm. main aspect of my of my martial art. Yeah. Just to, I, I don't want to go off on too much of a tangent, but I just yeah. on, on one of these points, you know, coming from a traditional background and then kind of winging it. The, MMA is kind of it's its own martial art now, isn't it? It's its own discipline. Yeah. And you go to an MMA gym, and that's what you do. Is there a? Do you see people progressing from traditional martial arts still into MMA, or are the people coming through now all all exclusively MMA trained? I think that depends on the knowledge of the parents and what the parents want. So, for example, if I if I had a child now my child would be learning MMA and Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu, specifically working on boxing, Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu and wrestling. They would be the three main. And I would have them from five years of age. And I'm not on about putting them in a cage or competing. I'm on about learning fundamentals, good good boxing fundamentals, 
good jujitsu fundamentals, and then they find their own path. I I would I would have them down that um, avenue learning MMA. I wouldn't have them learning a the traditional art, learning what I learned, and then having to, at eighteen, then having to change a lot of things, which then can become a problem because you've picked up bad habits in certain areas. Whereas you might as well just learn the good habits from a child. Whereas I think a lot of adults and a lot of parents, they don't, they, they want to put their kids into a traditional school for self-defense, for uh, keep them, you know, keep them on the straight and narrow. I don't think a lot of parents want, would want their children at five to, oh, I'm going to put him into this so that in 15 years time, he becomes an MMA world champion. So I would say that I have a different outlook on like what I would want for my child that a lot of parents would have for theirs. I'm not saying one's right and one's wrong, but I don't know. It's an awkward one. I, I don't think there's a problem with learning any martial art, mm -hmm. but if when it comes to fighting and it comes to street fighting and it comes to MMA, there's three disciplines that work. It's boxing. Obviously you can put the kickboxing in there as well because of the leg kicks. All right, but boxing's massive, which was what I always struggled with. The wrestling, wrestling's an incredible sport, and then you got your Brazilian jiu-jitsu, which is your jiu-jitsu. You know, people say it's Brazilian jiu-jitsu, jiu-jitsu on the floor, your grappling aspect of it, gi, no gi, whatever. Yeah. But they're the three main. You know, with all due respect, you don't see people in the octagon who are an expert in aikido, and there's a reason for that. Steven Seagal could probably pop in there, but, you know, because he was coaching Anderson and all that. But th there's a reason for that. It's because that style of martial arts isn't applicable to what them lads in that environment are doing. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. I'd, if we go back to being in the, the cage then, and I just want to ask you a little bit more about your mindset. Mm. You know, when you're in the cage, is it, so it's a sport, right? But yeah. you're in there. Are you thinking about winning, what it takes to win, or are you thinking about inflicting damage or hurting your opponent? What's going through your mind, Scott? Well, the first first couple I did, it was I did a few in Wrexham to start, and I I just remember like the pressure of it all. You know what I mean? Just having so much pressure on my shoulders, and just thinking, or oh, um. Oh, I hope everyone in, enjoys the fights and everything. I was more worried about other people than myself, probably. I, I got rid of that later. I, I started concentrating on myself and myself solely. But I remember the pressure. I don't ever remember ever getting into the cage wanting to seriously hurt someone. Never remember that. I remember going in wanting to win, and I'm going to win this fight. But the people I was fighting... And a lot of them I'm still in touch with today. They're good lads and everything. You know, they're in there for this. It's a sport. It's We're going to see who's the best. And then if, you know, if I win, I'm still going to go back to the gym on Monday and I'm going to work on what I need to work on for my next fight. If I lose, I need to work on what I've just lost on, which is what I was quite good at, to be fair. I would, I, I would pick up on, right, I need to work on that. Okay, so, is that, yeah. would, would you say that kind of mentality, that, that's the prevailing thought amongst most fighters, or all fighters, is is about winning a sporting contest rather than... Because you, yeah. you, you see it in some of the high-level promotions, there's a lot of promotion around it, promoting bad blood and so on. Yeah, is but, that just show business? Or? Yeah, it is, mate, it is. It's all to sell a lot of it. It does happen. You, you do get some fighters that genuinely don't like each other because they want to be the alpha. But mainly it's to sell tickets. It's to sell pay-per-view buys. And it, you you watch at the end of the fight, right? Now, if I hated you, right, and we had a fight, there's no way I'm going to shake your hand and hug you at the end of the match. I hate you. I'm not going to come nowhere near you. I, I'm not going to give you a hug. They all hug each other. They all shake each other's hands at the end. They all sit in the pre press conference and have a, have, have a drink and that, and they have a chat. Don't get me wrong. There are occasions where there's bad blood, but the majority of it is to beef up the fights, to sell the pay-per-views, because they all need to get paid. They're professional sportsmen. I, I I never, ever got involved in any of that. 
Mm. I wasn't going to slag anyone off or um, have any bad beef. As I say, I you know, a lot of the lads I I fought, I stay in touch with, and they're good lads, are great martial artists. So, in the build up to a fight, right? So in a pro fight, so in an yeah. amateur fight, I guess you're you're working, you got a job, you're training evenings and weekends and whenever you can. Um, you had four pro fights. Yeah. So it, I take it then that you're just working exclusively as a fighter and you're supporting yourself whatever way possible, but pretty much your full time. Yeah. So, so what would your preparation be? And I, so my, me, and my you, yeah, yeah, go on. Sorry, mate, go on. And, I, and if you could, because I, and I also want you to cover if you can, because you've got to make a particular weight, right. For a, right. for a contest. Yeah. Yeah. So if you're if you're naturally sixty kilos, right? What would you, in a professional fight, are you aiming to hit a weight category before that, below that? No. And and then bring your weight back up after the weigh-in. Yeah. What's so, what's the strategy around that? So by the time I got to a pro level, I was training when I was. This is when I was at elite in Oswestry. Street. I train Monday morning with Daryl and Steve. Monday night, I would be working in the gym. So Monday afternoon, I would swim. I got in my best shape when I was swimming. And um, when when I went uh, plant based with, with with my wife, uh, I started really concentrating on my diet. I got in really good shape for about two three years. Um, so I'd swim, then I'd work in the gym. Tuesday, I train Tuesday morning again. Tuesday night. Okay, so Tuesday morning would probably be a grappling session. Tuesday night would be a stand-up session. Wednesday night would be, I work Wednesday day. Wednesday night would be sparring night at elite. Thursday would be Thursday morning with Steve and Daryl again. And then Thursday night, we'd have Mick down. Friday, we would do a wrestling session Friday evening. And then Saturday morning was like an open mat type of sparring thing, Sunday off. That would be my normal weekly training. On top of that, I'd be trying to get two, maybe three swims in a week around work. So I'd swim for an hour and then I'd and then I'd go okay. straight into work. You know what I mean? Uh, never never got into the strength and conditioning side of it. I know a lot of lads that really expand on the strength and conditioning. I was never into lifting weights. The amount of lads I saw have injuries from lifting weights when I was working in the gym. I thought my rotator cuff goes, bicep goes. That's me out for eight weeks. I don't, I don't, want to lift weights so um say so i got more into the swimming things i was looking at what the diaz brothers were doing quite a lot of uh, i do the occasional run i always found my weight would be about 61 to 62 kgs back then and then i would cut to 57 which was fly weight i do that overnight so i could do four or five kilo overnight now when i first did it i did it wrong and it did not help me what one little bit. The last three, four times I did it, I I'd sussed it out by then. So I was using salt baths. And um yeah, I, I, I got it sus. So when I originally did it, I would I would practically not eat. And then I would sauna. And I'd sit in the sauna for as long as I could and just to get the weight off me. And I was so depleted. So depleted. In the end, what was happening was, so say I was fighting on a Sunday and I was weighing in on a Saturday midday, yeah? So you, you give yourself about 36 hours before you actually fight on the Sunday night. By 12 o'clock on the Friday, I, I'd get up, have breakfast, have my fluids like normal. Then by midday on the Friday, 24-hour window, I would stop eating, Okay. I would stop drinking water. I would have a salt bath about four or five o'clock in the afternoon. Put the Epsom salts in the bath, as hot as you can bear it. Have 15 minutes in the bath. Get out, wrap yourself up under a duvet because all, all the pores are open. And then I would lie there under the duvet, put the telly on and just relax. And then I do another one or maybe another two before I went to bed, Right. By the time I went to sleep at probably 10, half 10 that night, I'd probably be a couple of pound off by then. I might have stripped two, two and a half kilo off me already. So then by the time you get up in the morning and you urinate first thing in the morning, 
I found that I could either have another salt bath or I could have a quick 15, 20 minutes in the sauna, which is bearable. F 15 minutes, 20 minutes in the sauna. And then literally I put my clothes on and go straight away in at midday. And then what I would do then, obviously, as soon as I weigh in, I'd replace fluids with electrolytes. And then I would have a small, a small, like, like very small, uh, like a beans on toast or something. And then I would eat every hour, every hour and a half. And then once I got to like five o'clock, then I would eat every hour and a half. So, but if you have a massive meal straight away, it's just like, it's it's not good for you. you. Your body can't absorb. So just a real small meal. And by right. the time, when I sussed all that out, my performance level went up straight, straight away. Okay. So even with that, though, I mean, did you feel you'd recovered sufficiently from the weight cut, from the weigh-in to the yeah. actual contest, yeah? Yeah, I did. Yeah. I did. But you got to remember, Dave, I wasn't mm. cutting a lot of weight. I know lads like Mark Hanley and people like that, they, they used to cut massive amounts of weight. Like Aaron Abey is another one when we get him on. He's, I think, because of his cystic fibrosis, he, he's not even allowed to cut weight. I think he walks at 57 and he, he fights at 57. Right, because it's not, it's not, um, it's not good for him to be cutting weight. But I was only cutting three, four kilo, which is like seven, eight pound. You know, and that depended on how I was that day. Like some days, I could wake up, it'd be sixty one, it could be sixty. The heaviest I ever got to was about sixty two. So that was quite easy to do compared to other people. I know lads who so were seventy kilo cutting at fifty seven. Okay, people like Mark Platts and that. That's a big ask. That. Yeah. Okay. So i will just, if we can move away from the, the pro MMA fights yeah, yeah. that you've done, but just in terms of making weight categories in BJJ contest, I guess this is slightly different, right? I mean, does anybody try and cut weight in BJJ or are they just, do they just turn up and weigh in and whatever it is, they'll they, compete whatever? Yeah, yeah. Some people try and cut a bit of weight. You, you, you don't want to be cutting m massive amounts of weight in BJJ because you haven't got the time to replenish the fluids or the electrolytes. You're literally weighing in and you're going on. So like for me, I never cut weight in BJJ. I never have done. Literally, I struggled with my weight when I was out in Japan. I don't know if it was the long haul. I don't know if it was the food or what, but I was right on the verge. Normally, I put my gi on and I'm 63 kilo with my gi and I fight under 64. So, but then I was on different scales in Japan. I don't know if the scales were slightly out. So, but when I weighed in, when I actually competed, I was, I was under, even with the gi on. So, because I like to have a bit of breakfast, you know what I mean? I like to have a bit of fluids. So, um, but I know lads that do have cut a little bit of weight. They've struggled with the weight, but it's not, it's, you should be prepping that weeks out. If, if you feel you're that close to your weight category in BJJ, okay, just don't worry about cutting a two or three kilo fight up the weight category that time, put it down to experience. And then the next competition you do die out from eight, 10 weeks. And then that extra okay. couple of kilo will naturally come off and then you'll fit in that lower category the next time and just put fight into a higher weight category down to experience. Okay. Yeah. Um, okay. I mean, that's really interesting. Gab. Maybe if if we could just move on to some uh, more technical based, technique based um, <clears throat> areas. Yeah, I'm going to share with you a couple of statistics, Gav, and then talk to you about your kind of go to submissions or techniques in BJJ. Yeah. Um. So I got these statistics from an article on the BJJHeroes.com website, and it was called Crunching Numbers. And what they did was, and they took. They looked at all the contests of the 2015 World Jiu-Jitsu Championships. And there were 145 matches. Yeah. Within which there were 61 submissions. So that was a 42% rate submissions, the rest were points. Yeah. Which they validated comparing. So I guess that sounds fairly typical. And then they looked at the favored submissions from this contest. Yeah. Soak from the back, number one, 23%. Yeah. Arm bars, 22%. Yeah. And then you've got a massive drop down to the next favorite technique, which was a knee bar, 7%, triangle, 7%, yeah. 
triangle arm bar 5% and so on. So, but the, the main two submission techniques were choke from the back and arm bar. Yeah. And how does that relate to your experience and what are your kind no, of I, favorite techniques? I think, I think that's very, uh, very accurate. I think me personally, I like guillotines. The problem with the guillotine to finish it nine times out of 10, you got to be on your back. So that means if the person escapes it, then they're on top. But rear naked, rear naked chokes, arm bars, triangles, guillotines, kimuras. That's that's your that's your bread and butter. Your knee bars on that knee bars, the IBJJF level, are only legal at black belt and, and brown belt knee bars are. So if you're a white belt, blue belt, purple, you're not allowed to do them. So obviously them statistics are catering for brown belts and black belts as well. Yeah, leg locks have become very popular the last few years. Um, but I find with the straight foot locks, there's so many people that are good at defending them. So good at defending them. And I've even come across, I fought a lad in um, London, 2015. He's from France. And I had a foot lock on him and it was tight. And his foot was bending. I thought it was going to snap. He didn't tap like. He used it to come up, take my back. So I learned that day that I can't give the position up for the submission. Do you know what I mean? He okay. wasn't going to tap. If I just snapped his foot, he would not have tapped. And you do get people like that. That they're just willing, that they've got the flexibility in their ankles that, you know what I mean? They're just stubborn to it. Mm. So, um, but yeah, I would agree. I would agree with volume stats. Definitely. Definitely. And of there's course. a reason for it because it's basics. Basics wins yeah. fights. You see all these. So, so what, the, the problem that we've got now, I was talking to Alex Smith about this at RAF training the other day. So, Brazilian Jiu Jitsu black belt under Kev Capel and um, Hodger Gracie. And he's like, Hodger's always saying basics, 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 everything. And I'm, we were talking about it. And the problem is now, when you go on Instagram and you look at a lot of the techniques people are doing, they're going, oh, you can get this move, you can get that. And they're always trying to reinvent the wheel, right? If I do a technique on you on a video and you're relaxing, I can do that technique, right? Because it's not it's not getting pressure tested. But when you put it into an actual event, when the person you're against is going to try and arm by you, a lot of them techniques then do fall by the wayside. Now, I'm not saying there's, that there's certain times that you, do, you don't see them techniques, but how many times do you see a go-go platter? You, you do see it, but it's rare. You know, the budgie choke's the new one out there at the moment. A lot of people are, are, are all loving the budgie choke. So it's good for evolving stuff, but you can't put a video on Instagram uh, that is like, oh, I think this is going to work. And if it's not pressure tested, you put, put it out there because you're not going to get that off in that environment. Yeah. Um, and of course, it, the, the actual uh, types of submissions might vary, whether you're wearing a gi or you're not wearing a gi. Obviously, there's some yeah. things you can't do without a gi. Yeah. Um, but mate, there's, there's uh, other, other stuff as well that, that gives you the position. So when you look at fundamentals, you you got the, the back take, obviously the rear naked choke yeah. on that list, yeah? It's how do we get the back? So for example, arm drag, two-on-one grip, arm drag. I did a lot of that in America, the two-on-one grip. We worked on that for a week. Um, the, it's all about fundamentals, getting your fundamentals right. If you get your fundamentals correct, you can then go on to get them submissions. But there's a reason why that they they are high percentage. I've got some more stats for you, Gav. Yeah, this is from Statista.com, right. and they they did a breakdown of all the submissions uh, used in the UFC in 2017. Okay, so obviously no gi involved in these. Yeah. Rear naked choke, 44%. So again, it's the top. Yeah. So rear naked choke is the go-to high percentage move, isn't it? Yeah. Second is the guillotine choke, yeah. 14, only 14%. And then yeah. it's the arm bar, 13%. So the arm bar has dropped down a bit, but it's still a high percentage move. Um, And I guess... Uh, do you know why that is, you... do you think? Do you think an arm bar is easier to hit in the gi? I don't, I, well, I don't, 
is it? Yeah, I would say so. I would say so. Reason being is that, well, like, don't get me wrong, there's people that can hit arm bars, no gi to an extremely high level. But overall, when you look at when you look at an arm bar, obviously, if you take the pocket grip in the gi and then you you actually uh, take take your grips on the gi, you can use that grip. Unless you're working a two-on-one grip, which then you're going to go more arm drag and stuff like that. But then you're going to take your grips and then you're going to utilize your legs to start coming up high up the back. Okay. If you're in no gi and people start sweating, people are easier to posture up better. Because, whereas you can use the friction of the gi to get your positioning slightly better. Paddy's really good at it. Paddy do it both gi and no gi, but Paddy will, won't take a pocket grip now. He's taking a grip on the inside of the bicep. So then you can't get your elbow out past the groin. So he's got more to play with. So I think in the gi, it's probably easier especially when people start sweating no gi and, and then there's blood involved. It, it's it's like trying to armbar an eel. Okay. Um, from those two sets of statistics, like I, I'm assuming they're fairly representative and it sounds to you like that, that you, they make sense. Yeah, they do, yeah. From my kind of novice point of view in, in grappling, I'd be looking at that thinking, okay, what I want to be developing are setups and ways of getting rear naked choke and armbars. Yeah, they're the high, they're the high percentage moves. Is that something you'd suggest would be you, you, your fundamental if, for people to develop in, in grappling? Yeah. Those would be the definitely, mate. Definitely. So you're gonna you're gonna there's gonna be different stages to this, right? The submission is the end stage. All right, it's how do we get to the back to get the rear naked choke? How do we set up get into the back? How do we set up the setup to get to the back? How do we start our positioning? So, for example, there's a lot, a lot I've just said there, and a lot of people go, oh, what's he on about? But literally, right, if I'm going to take your back, okay, I need a guard in place, either a butterfly guard, a full guard, half guard, need an underhook to come up with a half guard. But let's say I've got a full guard just to make things easier, yeah? So I need my original uh, defensive position. Then I'm going to go two on one or I'm going to go arm drag. I need to drill the fundamentals of that. Then I need not only the timing, I need the ability to come up and hip out to come up to start taking the back off that arm drag. Yeah, which needs to be developed. Then obviously, then you need to look at getting your hooks in. You need to get your seatbelt with your gable grip. All, all these things that we need to get really good at before you even even put the choke on. So a lot of people just practice the, you know, get on the back and practice the choke. Well, no, you've got to practice getting to the back and getting yeah. all these things correct and breaking your techniques down. you got to do it over a period of time. Uh, a lot of people I find try and rush stuff. Oh, I just want to get good at this today. No, genuinely, if I'm, if I'm doing, so for example, I was with Kev on Thursday and he was teaching us, uh, a setup from like a collar and a pocket grip, right? Collar grip and a pocket grip, how to attack three different positions. I'll probably work on that for 12 months now. And I'm happy to work on that for 12 months because it works for him. It works for Hodger. It works. You know what I mean? The best people in the world are doing it, right? And I'm quite happy. I, I'm not going to go down to South Morton on Tuesday night, try it, go, oh, it doesn't work for me. I'm not going to do it. I'll just stay at it. And it's getting the fundamentals correct. I did that at blue belt and purple belt. I went back a lot to fundamentals and I still go back to fundamentals. I've read, I, I can't I can't remember who the coach attributed to, but I've read somewhere that um, in judo, for example, you would spend a year to develop a throw to be able to do it effectively. Yeah. So a, a throw a year. Yeah. Um, and you you know you have you come across the syllabus with sixty throws that you have to develop and learn, but really it's to get proficient at a technique or a setup. You it's something you have to drill then for over a long period of time for it to work. Definitely, definitely. That two on one grip I did in America, uh, uh, Marcelo Garcia gym in Dallas, Texas, with Rob and Chelson. I I was fascinated with how easily once they got the two on one. 
they were coming up and taking top position off it. Literally just l- locking the arm, locking my arm in like it was in a sling and then just switching the hips coming up, putting me on my back. It's two points. It's classed as a sweep. And I thought, oh, anyway, they showed us some other stuff off the two and one. That was two thousand. That was December two thousand and nineteen. I'm still working on it, right? But there's a lot of it that I'm hitting. So I guess uh, a kind of take home message from from that would be ad- advice to people training is is pick a few techniques to develop. Yeah. Over a long period of time and. Uh, and try yeah. hit those and yeah 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 and go with the percentages as well definitely go with the percentages and because it, it's a reason why they're always there it's because they work mm-hmm. it's because they work like okay i wonder if i could just move on gav yeah and talk about training and injuries right because we talked in the first episode we talked about longevity that's something that is yeah. quite important to you now and and for people martial arts getting older longevity becomes more important so um what kind of injuries have you encountered throughout your what was the worst injury you've had and what's the most common injury type worst injury i've ever had is 2020 i was training with a white belt i based my arm on the floor as i was passing the guard and he grabbed my elbow and he pulled it back the other way I thought he'd snap my arm, right? Anyway, I like rolled over, crumbled to the floor. I thought it was it had gone, and it's still bugging me now. So right in the you know the funny you got your funny bone under here, and then you've got the top of your ulna and radius here, and that joint. There's something in there that's it's not right. That's the worst one I've ever had in thirty odd years of being on the mats. Um, I went to work the next morning. Shouldn't have probably. The lads were like, oh, it's probably broken. I'm like, nah, it, it, it can move a little bit. Uh, but I was out for a month there. And then I and then I, obviously I was just teaching at Hodge for Costantinos around that for I couldn't roll properly for I'd say a good three months. But for two months I rolled, I managed it like. But that was just because a white belt didn't know what he was doing. You okay. know what I mean? But however, it was my fault because I shouldn't have put as, as the more experienced grappler, I shouldn't have put myself in the position to allow him to be able to do that. I should be controlling them roles. But it's it's hard when you're 95 kilo and they're, and they're big lads. That's the worst one I ever had. Um, I broke a lot of my toes. No problem. Strap them together. Dislocated shoulder. Uh, no, tore my rib in J- July last year at the inter services. So I've got a lump on my ribs. Uh, to be fair, I thought that was going to be really, really bad the next day. But after about two weeks, I couldn't train my normal self, but I was okay. Um, Ribs gone. Uh, I got to be honest with you, the worst thing that I've ever had to manage is hemorrhoids. Yeah, I might managed them for 15, 20 years. I had a big op last year. Um, No, sorry, not last year. Uh, November 2021, I had the op. Um, and I, I should have had it done when I was a young lad. So, but th- that was the worst. Apart from my elbow, that's the worst thing I've ever had to manage. That's a, I mean, that, that's an interesting one because it's, it's, it's firstly something probably a lot of competitors, if they suffer hemorrhoids, they may not discuss. Mm. Um, people are embarrassed about them. Yeah, but it's also something that isn't a result of a training injury, is it? It's, uh, it's just a, it's just no, something no. that happens. It's not. I think. I think because I've reflected on this quite a bit. My grandparents had them. Practically, more families got them. I think it's a very uh, hereditary thing. And I think when I was a teenager, when I was doing my jiu-jitsu, I was straining as a teenager against bigger men. I think that aggravated them because I started with them when I was probably sixteen, around there. But they were never bad. They were. They were never. Never bad. Like I did, didn't even acknowledge them really and then once i joined the raf in 2030 uh sorry uh 2015 i was 30 and what really did them for me we we did an exercise and they put us on rations for four days and proper as you can imagine the rations bung you up don't they 
So then I couldn't go to the toilet. And then I had to take like chocolates and laxatives to try and make me go to the toilet. Anyway, long story short, they were never right after that. And then I was obviously doing my competing with my jujitsu. And I just think as I got older, they just got worse anyway. But to manage them for, for, for years, especially the last seven years, to the fact that it's really bad. And unless you've ever had them, people do not understand how painful they are. Uh, that was probably the worst thing ever for me. Okay. Well, I think it's, it, it's you know, there might be many people who suffer those in yeah. competition and, and will relate to that. Yeah. I found um, another article here, Gav. Yeah. Um, and this is an academic article. It was published in 2014. Yeah. And it's called Assessment of Injuries During BJJ Competition. And it was from statewide BJJ tournaments in Hawaii between 2005 and 2011. Yeah. And what they found was that the majority of the injuries were, as you'd expect, orthopedic. And 39% of those were on the elbow, which kind of makes sense given, A, that the arm bar is one of the go-to techniques where you're going to hyperextend the elbow, but also yeah. when you're experience there i guess the elbow is probably the most common joint that's attacked in bjj yeah i know a lot of so, lads as well and i i had it when i went to paris in 2014 i had the uh, you know the, you get you get the tennis elbow don't you but i had mm -hmm. the golf the golfer's elbow and that okay. was that wasn't nice and what's the what's the golfer's elbow so you get your tennis elbow on the outside don't you Yep. The golfer's elbow is on the funny bone and it's, it's around the tendon around there. And okay. it's really, don't get me wrong, I, I put up with it and I fought and everything, but I had to strap it up, give it a little bit of support. But I think it's just from overuse and just uh, maybe leading up to a comp, I was a bit do, doing probably a bit too much. So it, 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 it died down after probably about five, six weeks and it went. And I've never, touch wood, I've never had it back ever. But I know a lot of lads would suffer with that as well, which is around that elbow joint that you're referring to. Yeah. Interesting, though, and you might be interested in this uh, yeah. statistic. The, the same article um, looks at the num the incidence of injuries per event of BJJ and makes a comparison to other martial arts. Right. And concludes, so for every thousand rules or thousand events, um, BJJ has an incidence of nine injuries. Right. That actually makes it safer than MMA, Taekwondo, Judo, and wrestling, which all have a higher incidence of, of injury. Yeah. So I guess in terms of a, a full contact martial art grappling, BJJ is actually the safest. And in terms of longevity, according to these statistics, it's probably the one that you can see yourself doing for longer with maintaining minimal injuries. Yeah. I think there'll be a number of reasons for that as well. I think, you know, the, the ability to be able to pull a guard. If you look a lot of like, so for wrestling, for judo, they don't want to be on their back. Okay. So they have to stay standing and try and get that takedown or that throw. And then the, a lot of the injuries that I've seen are from when people land awkward as they're taking someone down or, or someone's getting taken down. Whereas in in BJJ, if I'm with someone and I think, right, I'm going to get thrown here, I'm just going to pull a guard. And then I'll work something from the bottom. So I'm, you're able to eradicate that that throw and impact and landing on them a little bit. Obviously, it, com it comes part and parcel with wrestling and uh, judo and everything. But, and I think the, the refereeing, potentially and the way that so for example you can't do heel hooks in certain competitions because of the because of the knee and the, and the the reaping and stuff like that so jiu-jitsu has, has gone very when you read your books about what the gracies were doing okay there was always an element of safety there to a certain degree but jiu-jitsu has become very uh yeah it's a sport it's a great sport but let's make sure we look after our athletes I'm not, yeah. I'm not, don't get me wrong. I'm not saying judo and wrestling don't do the same because I know wrestling have done it with the weight cutting element of it. 
because there's a lot of lads dying from from weight cutting. So they changed the rules about 15 years ago regarding that they could only cut 10%. So it'll be similar in judo and it'll be similar in wrestling as well, where they're looking after the athletes better. It's just the fact that I think that that not getting a lot of judo lads struggle with their knees from the twisting and the throwing and that you probably know more about this than me because you spend more time with the judo lads. Well, I mean, I have, uh, I, have, you know, I think when we get an experienced judoka on, we'll, we'll talk to them about it, Gav. Yeah. You know, I pro- okay. probably haven't been doing it long enough, but yeah. Okay. Um, cer- certainly my knees are, are, are less than optimal, shall we say. Yeah. Um, we'll make a note yeah. of that and then we'll come back to that with, yeah. uh, with a joker. So obviously, the, and of course, historically, judo was developed um, to be a safe way to practice jujitsu, if you like, you yeah. know. Yeah. So it, so it, it's always had since its inception, it was it's had a safety element. Yeah. Um. No surprise, MMA is the most dangerous. Um, with an incidence, according to this article, an incidence of up to 286 injuries per thousand um, occasions. Yeah. I thought was I found another article that was um, an MMA. 58 to 78 percent of all injuries in MMA are head traumas. Interesting. Now, because... What do you think about that, Gav? Well, I understand it because they're fighting with four ounce gloves, Hmm. but here's a question for you. What's safer MMA or boxing? I, I I know the, I know the, I I know the answer to this. Okay. And a lot of people know the answer to this. Okay. Go on. What were you going to say? I was going to say, I'll look it up because I don't want to, I don't want to say something, but if you've got, if you know, go on. What is it? Okay. So, You can, there's people that can jump on stats with this, okay? But if we look at it logically, I'm fighting you in an MMA competition, in an MMA bout, yeah? You hit me with a good strike. I've got the ability to grab you, to clear the cobwebs. I've got the ability to take you down. I've got the ability to very similar to boxing, to circle off and try and clear the cobwebs, like what Nate, Nate Diaz does, or sits down on his bum and gets his legs in the way and like pulls the guard, right? In boxing, you haven't got that ability. You've got to just move around the ring, okay? So the second part of this is that if you hit me in MMA, right, and you hit me and put me down, right, if I fall in a certain way or... You, you'll see it. There's different degrees. The referees classes uh, stoppages. So if I, if I go down and I bang my head like that, it'll be like instant stoppage. Yeah. If you go down face first and your arms are limp, instant stoppage. Yeah. Whereas if you go down and your legs are up and your arms are up, okay, and you're, you're protecting yourself to a certain degree, the refs will let it go because they still know you're compass mentis. In boxing, right, you don't really get stoppages unless there's a cumulation an accumulation of head strikes right now in mma you get that to a certain degree but the worst thing about boxing is you've been hit you've been concussed you go down and then what does every boxer want to do they want to carry on with the fight they want to get back up they'll try and do their best in that 10 second count to get back up in mma that's taken away from you by the referee Okay, so even if you're concussed, the ref's like, no, it's over. It's finished. How many boxers have got back up and have accumulated more head trauma? And if you look at the if you look at the Ward and Gatti fight on YouTube, the first one, when he hits him with that body shot, okay, how Gatti carried on, I, I'll never know. But literally, if you look at that fight, that fight could have been stopped many a time. Whereas in yeah. the MMA, it would have been stopped earlier and they wouldn't have took that trauma as much. I think there's also, and there will be, there will be, um, you know, particularly medical based studies looking yeah, at yeah. this, but there's also the, you know, a, a boxer might go 12 rounds with, and they've got bigger gloves and they can take, because of that, they can take many strikes to the head. And yeah, what's the cumulative impact of that 
compared to one or two strikes resulting in a knockout with lighter gloves. Uh, what's the the long term effect? I don't I don't know the there might yeah. be an answer to that, but I don't know. It. Yeah, no one will ever really know that. I don't think, but. What you've got to remember with MMA as well, going back to the point, is with boxing, you either punch the head or you punch the body, right? With MMA, you can punch the head, you can punch the body. You can also kick the legs, which aren't going to concuss you. You can knee the body, which is damaging, but it's not going to concuss you. So when you look at CTE and concussions-based injuries, boxing, personally, I think it's got to be far worse than MMA. Because, as I say, the amount of times that I've been hit, and I've taken someone down. There's there's a fight I did, right? I fought um, a lad called Colin Neeson in Wrexham. And he hit me with a knee to the head, right? A flying knee. And for about a minute and a half of that round, I was out of it. But I'm on the floor grappling. So I was able to clear the cobwebs and recover. I didn't take no more headshots because I was grappling. Yeah. Okay. But, and, and, and so, the, you know... I think there's a, a debate to be had there, but that what what is the long term impact of that concussion? Maybe that resulted in some, I, I you know, unless you had a scan or, or something, you don't know. Maybe you had, maybe it caused some bleeding. What's yeah. the impact of that when you get hit again? Yeah, and the, yeah. and and you know, so I think the fact that head trauma is an often reported injury, I think it should be something that. I'm, I, I'm sure. Yeah. yeah, I'm sure people take notice of it. But these are risks for they are. They are. longer term brain problems. Yeah. So they are. Um, yeah. But I, okay, I, I, but... I've, I've had several of them. But what I'm saying is, is, and I totally, you're totally right with everything you're saying. But the amount of times that the grappling, being able to grapple and engage in a grapple, has been able for me to clear the cobwebs regain my composure and then not take any more shots to the head till the end of that round and then or to get to the end of the fight if i would have had to stand up and take more head shots on top of the concussion i think it's even worse that, that's that's the point i'm trying to make you know what i mean i think the grappling saves you to a certain degree just on that and going back to you know the kind of mentality you had going into the cage i've seen examples where a fighter's been struck mm. and they've been knocked out. They're knocked out before they hit the ground. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. When they've hit the ground, the other fighter is still hitting them in the yeah. head. Yeah. And the referee has to dive in and, and save them. Yeah. What's, go what's going on there, Gav? Does the fighter not realize that the opponent's knocked out? But why are they? It, it does, that for me is something that makes me deeply yeah. uncomfortable when I see that. Yeah, personally, I don't like it. Um, when someone's out, they're out. Every everyone knows, like, well, like, you know, I, I, I don't want to brag about, but I've hit people, and I know that the, you you know that they're out. Like, do you know what I mean? Um, you don't need to be hitting them repeatedly afterwards. The fight's won. The argument's over. Uh, probably the referee. What I'll say for the referees are they're probably too far away to step in quickly enough because everything can happen in a heartbeat. So um, if you look at if you look at Bisbing and Henderson's a great example, their first fight, UFC 100 in London. Uh, Bisbing, uh, Henderson hit him, caught him, knocked Bis Bisbing was out, and then Henderson just dived through the air and then finished him. It was no need for it. There was bad blood going into that fight, though. You know what we were talking from episode one, where people sometimes beef up fights? Well, genuinely, there was bad blood between them two. So Henderson hated him. Still no need for it. I'm like you. I don't like it, mate. I don't like it. You know, it, it's a sporting contest, like. So I, I personally, it's it's a, that is a part of the sport that, um, that I think the worst ones are is and uh, what was his name now? Uh, Rusmov was it Rusmov Pahares? He was the one who was heel hooking everyone and not letting go. I'll have to look that up for you. I'm pretty sure it was him. He heel hooked about four or five lads. He wouldn't let it go. That that's very similar. You know what I mean? The lads have tapped. Let go. Yeah. The problem you get though with the taps is that you'll get a sub on someone. Someone will tap, 
the ref wouldn't see it and they'll pop their head up and go, I didn't, I didn't tap. Right. So, so that's why uh, I'll say we need to get Paddy on the podcast. I know Paddy's had that in a few competitions. So if we make a note of that as well, and we'll discuss that with Paddy when we get Paddy on. Uh, Paddy's told me he's had it a number of times where he's had people in locks and they've tapped. He's let go and they go, I haven't tapped and the refs to carry on. So, but yeah, I'll, I'll make a note of that. And yeah. We'll, we'll yeah. go forward with that with Paddy, all right? Things for future episodes. We've been talking yeah, for a yeah. while, Gav, and yeah, I, yeah. I wanted to, I, I had wanted to cover um, some more technical aspects, but I think let's come back to those in a later podcast. And no, no worries. Pr- probably we've covered quite a lot there. Yeah. Um, yeah. So I'm, I, I'm happy just to, to conclude this podcast and uh, this episode, and we'll come back. There'll plenty of issues to pick up on in later okay. episodes. Brilliant, mate. So what we'll do, we'll bring the podcast to a close now. I'll just mention a couple of sponsors again. So uh, for all those out, out there, if you want any of your uh, rash guards, geese, spats, anything like that, just get in contact with a grappler's gift. Uh, Craig Stanton, uh, he supplies me with all my kit. Really good lad. Um, ex-military. So if you uh, if you're serving in the military as well, he will give you a military discount. I don't know how much, but you, that's always negotiable. So get in touch with Craig. Uh, we've also got um, Josie's Chippy. If you're in the Rosa Medre area in Wrexham, please go da- down there for fish and chips or chip cone and curry. It's absolutely outstanding. So uh, that's Josie's Chippy. Uh, you can follow him on Instagram and Facebook. So we're going to bring episode two to a close now. Thank you everyone for listening in and we will see you on episode three. And we will then be telling you on episode three, the guests that we're going to be having on the podcast the next few weeks. Okay, take care, everyone. Safe rolling.